Hi guys, uh, welcome to the show. In our show, The Differentiators, uh, we talk to achievers from various backgrounds to understand their journeys, which will help us unlock key insights and ideas that will stimulate our learning and growth. I'm your host, Aditya, and I have my co-hosts, Yashas and Shreyas, for today. And uh, our differentiator for today, uh, we have is uh, Richa Srivastava, uh, who is the managing partner at Makers Asylum. So Makers Asylum is a community space focused on fostering innovation through purpose-based learning, focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, Richa is a graduate from uh, the Indian School of Business, and in her previous stint, uh, she worked with the government of Andhra Pradesh to drive IT invest investments into the state. Uh, she also worked in the Indian telecommunications industry before this as well. So uh, thank you, Richa. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'll get started uh, with a few questions. So I think uh, you guys were in a transition uh, for, for the past few weeks, uh, if I'm not wrong. Yes. So I think you shifted yes. your office from one place to another. So, so where are you right now? So we've uh, moved Makers Asylum from uh, Mumbai to Goa. So we've all, uh, my, our entire team has moved to Goa right now. That is great, Goa. So can I ask the reason why Goa? So we've been, um, I mean, obviously, um, Makers Asylum has been in Mumbai for about seven years now. And uh, we originally started out of a garage in Bandra and slowly, slowly sort of grew the community space. Uh, at the moment, we had a very large uh, infrastructure space, physical infrastructure space, about eight to 9,000 square feet in Mumbai, which is a fairly expensive, uh, you know, uh, thing for uh, any organization to sort of work with. And because of the pandemic as well, uh, most of our programs, which are generally international and a lot of people come to the space, we obviously do a lot of experiential learning at the, at the space. So people come into the space, they uh, are working with each other, they collaborate with each other. So there's a lot of physical element uh, into what Makers Asylum is all about. So obviously because of uh, uh, COVID, uh, all of that seems like a little bit more unclear for this year. Uh, so that's the reason why we thought it'll be a good time to, uh, and it was obviously uh, as every other business, there were some hard decisions that we had to take in terms of sustaining ourselves. So uh, we decided to give up the space and choose the team that we are with. And all of us decided to move together to Goa. Hopefully over here, we were. Uh, it's obviously a little bit more cheaper, all of that, but it's also very beautiful. So hopefully our creative energies will be much higher over here. Right. That's good to know. So, so can you just uh, give a brief on uh, Makers Asylum? Uh, when it started, how it started, and uh, when did you join and what's your role there? So can you just brief yeah. a little bit about the journey? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, Makers Asylum started back in 2013. Uh, by my uh, partner and founder of the space, Vaibhav Chabra. He's also my partner in real life. Uh, he's my husband now. But at that time, of course, when he started, he was uh, doing this by himself. Uh, so um, he started this back in 2013. He was in Boston before this. He did his undergrad over there. And, uh, and he was working at MIT Media Labs, one of the startups there uh, called iNetra. They were into virtual diagnostic, eye diagnostic devices. So as a project, uh, he'd moved back to India at that point in time to sort of take their project forward in India uh, as a technical lead. But at the same time, uh, I mean, he was facing a personal challenge of, um, because it was a hardware product, uh, it re required a lot of prototyping and upgrading. So obviously in India, uh, there were no spaces like a maker space where you could actually go and use a tool. You obviously had to give those to you know service providers. So you basically lose... In the process, obviously, you lost a lot of, uh, you know, learning of the product upgrade and what you're doing. So as a personal uh, need, he started the space back in 2013, just as a out of a garage in Bandra, like I said earlier. Uh, it was just more of uh, the ceiling of his office fell down and he called people to sort of build tables. So I met Webhub as well back in 2013 when I was working with Idea Cellular. Uh, at that point in time. And uh, it was a community space. It was a really cool space. So one of my friends had told me that uh, you've just moved to Bombay. What are you doing on weekends? So why don't you go to this space called Makers Asylum? You learn something. So that's how I sort of met him. And I you know, went to the place and it was just like a little uh, garage. And there were a lot of people and always really interesting people that you could hang out with. And you know, um, there were artists, designers, makers, all kinds of 
you know, geeks, sort of, you know, it was like a hangout for uh, people who were not partying, I guess, at that point in time and just, you know, making stuff. So that's how uh, I met him back in the day. But um, overall, Makers Asylum, just for everyone who's listening to this, is a community maker space. Where, what I mean by community maker space is that uh, it is a physical infrastructure that started off with the uh, uh, with a lot of tools and equipment. So you can see, you know, there are things like 3D printers, laser cutters, uh, a metal working shop, a woodworking shop, uh, you know, virtual reality lab. So there's a lot of tech, hardware tech that is there. And uh, just like gyms anywhere else, like, you know, you access gyms and you have common tools and equipment to use. Similarly, Makers Asylum is like a space for people to come and use and share tools. And obviously in the process, you get to learn and you get to collaborate and all of that. So yeah, that's pretty much how we started. And slowly, slowly, we moved from that space to multiple spaces. And uh, over the last seven years, we've had a really lovely community in Mumbai where everyone sort of come in and grew the space with us. Right, so, so can you talk about what you are, you, what you are doing at uh, Makers Asylum? What's your role there? So I started working with Makers Asylum, uh, I think about two and a half years ago. Uh, my role, uh, I'm, I mean, my official designated title is managing partner, but what primarily I do is a lot of, uh, I mean, a bunch of stuff. We all do everything. All our team is very flat in the sense that there's no, uh, differentiation in terms of, you know, we do a lot of stuff together, but my particular role sort of focuses on building collaborations, uh, looking at the business operations and execution side of things, also a lot of, into brand and marketing of the of, uh, of the organization as such. So a lot of partnerships, a lot of collaborations, a uh, lot of new things that can happen at the space and how can we financially sort of uh, uh, sustain the business. So a lot of my work goes around uh, sort of opening up revenue opportunities, what we can do more with the space and things like that. Yeah. Right. Not the most fun one, but yeah, somewhere yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> that actually sounds uh, very interesting actually so just to hear out the various machines that you have placed in your makers asylum makes me gonna like, go visit the place at least once probably sometime <laughs> down the track yeah so, now you guys uh, have to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah so um uh, just hearing about it i think there'll be a lot of learning that happens like co-learning though you're just, just because of being in the environment are there any yeah. uh, instances of such co-learning leading to some other serendipitous uh, uh, result? Uh, yeah, I think it's been, um, I don't know if one instance comes to my mind. I think every day is like that at this space because we have like, you know, a, it's, you know, when you go to work for us, what happens is that you can bump into anybody, you know, because there's such interesting people that walk into the space on a regular basis. So I would say that it's just a very uh, regular occurrence of, you know, meeting new people and sharing ideas every day. Uh, but we've been doing a lot of, um, I mean, we do a lot of collaborative work with organizations and, uh, you know, various uh, other individuals, freelancers, for example, uh, with organizations, we work a lot on product development with them. For example, say uh, a Godrej or a, you know, or a Nippon or a HUL for that matter. We work with them collaboratively to sort of create more products and interesting concepts and ideas that would generally not happen somewhere else. So the space allows us to sort of, you know, bring in that element of hardware and design along with sustainability to the table. So for example, we created something, um, it's a plastic recycling lab, basically inside an auto uh, that goes around teaching kids uh, the circular economy of plastic. So it basically has a whole sh extruder, uh, shredder, the whole unit of plastic recycling inside a mobile lab. And at the back end of that is a 3D printer, which shows, so if you take out a filament from here, you can put inside the 3D printer and print a different product out of a bottle that you've just shredded and, you know, sort of made. So it sort of becomes a really interesting way to visualize plastic recycling. And this has been going now in a bunch of schools in villages and remote areas to sort of really teach kids how to, you know, and there's obviously a lot of content around it that sort of goes. So a lot of kids have been learning with it. So it's quite interesting the way that things have happened. Uh, for And then like serendipitous things, for example, there is this member at our space that is working on a satellite ground station. 
which is an open source satellite ground station and it's like a really cool project i mean you don't get to see something like that in this other you know i don't know like i've never seen something like that happening somewhere else for me it was like wow this is so interesting so yeah a lot of things like that so on one hand like there's a satellite ground station that's being made on the other hand there's this artist who's making skateboards uh, at the woodworking shop so it's just like a it's like this really different kind of energies in the space on a daily basis it's quite exciting right i think uh, you know if we go back to the time when the lockdown started i think you guys have been pretty busy uh, for the past few months uh, in terms of the work yeah. that is going on at makers asylum because i i've read a few articles uh, out there so i think there was an article uh, in which you were featured uh, in vogue india so uh, where uh, i think you guys made uh, uh, about 1 million m19 face masks or face shields uh, yeah. so can you just talk about uh, was that planned or how did that happen uh, this whole uh, past few months uh, how how did the work uh, work happen how did you uh, bring in so many people uh, to actually work on uh, you know so many uh, face shields yeah so uh, i think the last couple of months has been one of our busiest uh, for us at makers asylum because uh, uh when uh, the lockdown started on the 23rd of march we mm-hmm. all decided to um, you know self isolate at the asylum at our space in mumbai uh because obviously one we would get bored at home and there was no other nothing else to do at that point in time so we thought that it, at least if we are at the space we'll do something creative something more fun so we were sort of making content for like our programs and we were thinking about you know how to sort of digitize things for makers asylum at that point in time and then we um, the next day i think we started um, uh, so we we are connected with a lot of the open source community in the us and other parts of the world and because you know the lockdowns had started earlier over there a lot of the open source community was really doing some interesting stuff so we came across the face shields in one of these open source community you know uh conversations and we thought maybe you know let's just prototype it at our space because it's just be you know something i mean uh, something that could be possibly you know effective and helpful for the healthcare community so we started prototyping uh, we had a laser cutter so we just you know did something very basic and we put it up on the social media and at that point we had no idea that you know the situation with ppes was so grave in india because there was a lack of ppes at that point in time even for a very long time after that because we were not india was not a manufacturing uh, you know was not manufacturing uh, ppe or in general so when we put it out there a lot of hospitals and doctors and the healthcare community started reaching out to us saying that they needed it so um uh, so i mean and the request sort of started getting quite aggressive because a lot of people in and especially because mumbai was the epicenter for a lot of things because the you know the outbreak was a little bit uh, more at scale in mumbai so the doctors obviously were a little bit more i think tensed at that point in time because they did not have these equipment so they started reaching out to us and uh, that's when we decided that you know that's when we realized that the situation is pretty grave outside so how can we really help so while we were quarantining at the asylum we thought we started a campaign to uh, of donating 1000 face shields that's what we started uh, in, in initially where we said that okay there were only three of us over there so we said that okay fine we'll just make 1000 because maybe 1000 is something that we can do then uh, we decided okay let's just make the goal a little bit larger make it 10000 and then start working on it and slowly slowly we started working on it uh, on the designs and uh, you know started making those but uh, soon we realized that obviously even if we you know have 15 20 people at the space because the process was very manual at that point in time because you had to cut the, on the laser cutter you had to sort of assemble things and you know all of that we went through almost 21 design iterations in the process of making these face shields so it was pretty quick because you had to also think about material you had to think about what is available and at that point in time remember there was no supply and logistics i mean the supply chain was completely choked so there was no accessibility over there uh, at that point in time so to just work around what materials will be useful and how we can sort of you know scale this up was quite a bit of a challenge and that's when we realized that um, obviously we believe in the you know we believe a lot in the open source culture and community and that's what we decided to open source our designs on our platform 
and we also open source the process of how to make it. And then we started, um, then a lot of people across India sort of started coming in and saying that we want to make these over here for our local community. And slowly, slowly that sort of grew into a much larger movement. And at the end of it, I think in about 49 days, we were able to make about a million shields, uh, uh, you know, with 42 cities, towns and villages sort of joining hands from different parts of the world, uh, sorry, different parts of the country and world. In fact, we were getting requests from Kenya, Australia, uh, even in the US, a lot of people were sort of working on that, this design because one, uh, a lot of uh, people uh, who were making face shields at that time were making face shields with 3D printers. Now, the problem with 3D printers is that they are slow and they're also expensive. So a normal face shield would cost you anywhere between 200 to 250 or even more, uh, depending on what kind of printer are you using. With a laser cutter, uh, the great thing about this particular tech was that one, the laser cutting industry is a small industry already in different parts of India, because it it's the industry which is used by uh, you, uh, which is generally making a lot of marketing collaterals. So, for example, a lot of marketing collaterals that you see outside, like hoardings, you know, all of that. A lot of it, the you know, the laser cutter cutters, which are the small businesses, they do a lot of work already around. So, there are existing machines in different parts of India uh, already, which are there. And uh, the fact that it's really faster than a three D printer, like you can make about five hundred to a thousand shields a day on a laser cutter versus like a 50 or 100 maybe maximum on a 3D, not even that many, I think, depending on what kind of 3D printer you have. So the scale becomes really large. And that's how we sort of, you know, capitalized on the equipment, the materials and all of that, along with the community effort of bringing in everyone together and sort of scaling this up really pretty quickly. Right. So Freyas, you had something? Yeah. Uh... So how can maker spaces uh, accelerate the product development for a company or a person? So I think uh, the really interesting part about maker spaces is that one, uh, you get to do, you get to make by yourself, right? So that it's in itself makes the process much faster. So you, if you have access to, for example, a 3D printer and you have something in mind, I mean, uh, digital fabrication makes it really simple and easier to prototype something you know that you have in mind so if you have anything that you have in mind you can visualize it and you can use a, a digital fabrication tool to make it come to life in no time so i think that in itself sort of scales your uh, sort of scales your product from idea to actually a prototype in no time so maker spaces in my opinion enable that process and offer that speed because you can do pretty much everything at a maker space with respect to product designing, product, uh, maybe you will not be able to scale to say a million or like, you know, I mean, the scale comes in a little later because there are now better manufacturing processes post prototyping that you will have to access to scale. But that whole ideation to actually prototyping and making something tangible becomes really quick. For example, in the case of this shield, uh, the turnaround time for us to make a product like this was about, you know, two to three days which is generally not the case if you don't have access to these kind of equipment, right? Uh, so a space like this sort of enables you to really make that, I mean, it really enables the speed, I would say. And, a, and at the same time, obviously, a space like this on a normal day is also, you know, great for collaboration. So obviously, your ideas become into really, um, you know, um, tangible products in no time because of the kind of expertise you have in the space on a on a human level, because they're like designers, there are, you know, people who are really great with manufacturing, people who are really good with electronics, all working together in the same space. So the interdisciplinary nature of a, of a space like this really fuels innovation and the speed of innovation, I would say. So, so India has uh, grown up to become a status, uh, startup space. The, 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 world, the world is growing. People uh, even start up as a journey, as a career op option was very limited before. So yeah. in this context, how, uh, how important would open source really become in India? Because currently, most of it, uh, they look at uh, patenting as one option, even before they approach. But how, how does open source contrast it and how does it actually help startups? I mean, I think for... Um, I mean, we've always had this internal discussion because uh, open source, we do work in both spheres. For, exa uh, for example, if you're working with a company, obviously there are NDAs and there are, you know, things that 
happen over there where you have to be close in terms of the way that we're working with them. And then of course, as a large community, we focus a lot on open innovation. And for, uh, for us personally, uh, we believe that open innovation really, again, uh, expedites your, you know, uh, your go-to market. Uh, because for example, if you were, you know, if you get into patenting, obviously there's a lot that goes into it. One, there's a lot of resource that's involved. You have to have a lawyer, you have to have a legal team, you have to have, I don't know, like a bunch of other stuff that is needed. You need to have capital maybe, you know, there is, there is a lot of resource that is needed to go from just making a product to actually creating a patent. And there's obviously time and effort that goes into it. Uh, so that's one part of it, which open innovation really, uh, you know, sort of brings uh, the speed to, because uh, if it is open source, obviously you can build on top of it. So there could be an existing idea in the world, uh, which could be in any part of the world. And you just need to, you know, source that idea. And because it's open source, you can build on top of it. And the, and, and the speed with which you will go to market is possibly much more faster. You can obviously monetize that product because nobody's going to stop you from monetizing that product. And what truly patent really does is that really limits you to a certain kind of you know, progress. Because at the end of the day, if you've taken that effort to patent something, and then somebody else creates something better than you, which is obviously the case because this is, you know, innovators and disruptors are everywhere. So uh, that time lost in between is something I believe that entrepreneurs can avoid when they, you know, go in with open innovation, because that's when you are able to test out your product very quickly. And if it's not working, you can, you know, rebuild something else because in most cases, you will fail. 99% of the times you do fail. And to actually get to the final product, you need to really, really create, uh, you know, keep, keep creating. And when you go into a patented uh, way of sort of thinking about things, then you're really closing your mind to a lot of, you know, other things as well, because you're driven by obviously the investment of time and the effort. But of course, both of them have these advantages and disadvantages, but we believe a lot in open innovation. It's uh, coming to open source, uh, the licensing uh, issues that might come up in an open source project. Uh, well, uh, there are different kinds of licensing, I think, uh, that happens in open source projects as well. So a bunch of open source, there are, there's open hardware licenses that are there where uh, a creator of the project can give you license to, you know, uh, build on top of it. So uh, a lot of times, I mean, that really works in most cases, um, but I'm not an expert on this particular uh, field of, you know, uh, in terms of licenses, et cetera. I think there'll be somebody, uh, you know, Webhav or Anul from my team who are like more into the tech part of it could describe it better. But what I understand overall is that there are different kinds of licenses and, you know, you can navigate through it pretty quickly. Right. So... If we, if we talk about your journey, right? Uh, I mean, I think you've been in strategic roles even before uh, Makers Asylum. So, uh, you know, I think you were an executive assistant at IDEA and then uh, in the government of Andhra Pradesh as well. So how has those roles, how has the experience in those roles helped you in, in Makers uh, Asylum? Uh, I think, um, I think very early on in my career, I think uh, I had access to a lot of, uh, knowledge, I would say, in terms of experience that was there in the room, especially when I started my career with Idea Cellular as well. Uh, uh, my uh, boss at that time was the uh, chief technology officer of Idea. So, uh, you know, I just graduated from uh, uh, engineering and I had um, stepped into this role after about like one and a half, two years of my experience. So there was a lot about the telecommunication business uh, that you understand from that, you know, that view when you're looking at somebody who's, who's handling pretty much 95% of the budgets of the company, which is a pretty large company in general. So you're interacting with, um, the leadership of the organization, which is of course, you know, way more experienced than I was obviously like 40, 50 years of experience more than I was at that point in time. And I think uh, for me, it was just like, um, it was a very opportune moment to be a fly on the wall and listen to all these conversations about strategic decisions being made about a business. Uh, how does technology play a role? Because uh, given that my uh, input was more around, uh, you know, research around tech for him at that point in time as well, uh, gave me a lot of insight into sort of how holistically you can approach, you know, looking at an organization because there are a lot of elements to an organization. There's not only tech, there's business, there is, you know, 
finance, there is procurement, there is, you know, a bunch of other stuff, uh, especially with organizations. Uh, so yeah, it gave me a very holistic perspective. And then even after that, when I went to, uh, that's when I re uh, re realized that I needed a little bit more formal education in business as well. That's when I went to Indian School of Business for my uh, MBA uh, to um, sort of um, have a marriage between technology and business, because those are two, two things I'm really interested in. And then uh, post that, uh, I got an opportunity to work with the government as well, where I got a really, uh, really interesting insight into how governments work, uh, because uh, what I was part of was the IT ministry and the chief minister's IT advisory and strategy. So basically, my role sort of in, uh, you know, involved a lot of um, branding, marketing, and um, you know, outreach to create a fintech ecosystem in Vizag. Uh, in Vishakhapatnam, where uh, my role was primarily to go out uh, to different countries, learn from them, come back, also uh, get startups into the ecosystem. How do you evaluate that? How do you also navigate the process inside a government, which is a pretty large, uh, you know, organization to sort of navigate through. So my experience in idea sort of helped me a little bit over there because, you know, idea is also a very large company. It had about over, I think, uh, 10,000 or 12,000 employees at that point in time. So it's pretty large in terms of, you know, the expanse as well. Sort of helped me um, also navigate through the government uh, uh, body and also appreciate it because before that I was really agnostic to governments and really never thought that, you know, they uh, with like all of us think that they don't work, but they do work quite a bit. So that was quite exciting for me. And then all of that put together, I think now I'm on more of an entrepreneurial journey because it's pretty much, uh, you know, uh, a startup. Uh, but I think uh, what is common between all the roles that I've done is that it's been very entrepreneurial, even when it was in, inside an organization. So, you know, these days, uh, I don't know, there's a term I believe called intrapreneurs or whatever you call it, where, you know, people are motivated by, uh, to, you know, sort of uh, have their work, work ways around different organizations. I've always been like that, I guess. So, um, yeah, so that all of that has sort of really helped me. Uh, think a little bit more strategically for Makers Asylum because uh, when Webhav started it, it was more of a community space. It was a foundation. Uh, there was different thought process around it. it. You know, so we've sort of come down to creating new products, uh, creating new avenues of you know how the organization can really uh, self-sustain. So all of this, of course, has really added value to me and hopefully now to Makers Asylum. I think Makers Asylum, the, the whole work that is going on there, I think that is aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So I think there are about 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, that are there. So can you just explain how is that aligned? How, how does that uh, you know, work that we do, that you do at uh, Makers Asylum is connected to those Sustainable Development Goals? Uh, yeah, so uh, Makers Asylum primarily, um, like I said, we work a lot on alternative learning and alternative education as well, where we focus a lot on experiential learning, where people come in from different backgrounds and sort of come to the space to learn various things from us. So we have a particular program that we've been running for about four to five years now, along with the French Embassy in India and UNESCO and a few other university partners in Europe, where it's called the SDG School. Uh, and this particular program is like a, uh, it's uh, anywhere between two weeks to four weeks long uh, program where we host it uh, once a year in India. Uh, and then we host it once a year in Paris. And uh, this program sort of brings in together different kind of people from different countries to sort of work on the UN SDGs in India or in France. And uh, basically um, we take them through the process of design thinking, introducing them to frugal innovation and also instilling the skills of rapid prototyping through digital fabrication and others to come up with solutions aligned to the UN sustainable development goals. So as part of the process, uh, as part of the process of design thinking, they come up with their problem statements that they're solving, which are aligned to the local community issues, if it's in Mumbai or if it's in Paris. And then they work towards these uh, goals to sort of come up with um, solutions which are tangible solutions and concepts that they've prototyped at uh, during the program we've been running this for almost about uh, 2016 four years now and this year this year we'll also be uh, taking this program online in december so we are bringing we're curating it 
online. So now people, obviously everyone, we have about alumni, about over 500 alumni in 25 different countries. So hopefully now we'll be able to reach out to more countries through the program. And we hopefully soon will have it again running uh, physically at our space in Goa as well in the next year. So that's Richard, one of the you, programs that we do, yeah. Okay. Uh, you have experience in corporate, in government organizations and in a startup. So which yeah. do you like the most and why? Uh, that's a tough question. <laughs> I think uh, I think uh, all of them have been really uh, unique experiences. What I, I like, my personal belief is that till the time you're really, really enjoying work, uh, uh, that's the that's good enough for me. And I think on all three, it's been every time I've moved into a different role, it's been more exciting than the previous role. So I have to say in progression, it has been like that. So when I started with idea and then when I went to the government, it was more exciting than that. And now when with makers, it's like even more exciting because now it's like your own, you know, own work and your own organization and a lot of personal decisions uh, that I have to make. So it, it's like very, uh, yeah, the ownership is even more higher in this third step. So I think uh, this is going to be even more exciting. I mean, it's already, already been very exciting and it's going to be even more exciting going forward. Uh, so uh, what do you think is the most important thing for uh, startups uh, success? <laughs> I wish I, uh, I wish I had an answer to it because even, I mean, it's not like, um, I think it's more about, uh, for, I think for me now, given that it's been almost about two and a half years of journey, I think it's been a lot about resilience and belief in uh, your idea and uh, believe that it's going to, you know, happen. I think it's a lot about uh, believing in yourself. I think as entrepreneurs, everybody needs that. And that personal motivation is very uh, essential for anyone to succeed because un unless you're resilient and unless you're really, really, you know, uh, trying to make your ideas happen and see them sort of coming to life, uh, there's nobody else, no investor, no, um, you know, mentor, or no other, per you know, other startup or no other person can really give you, uh, you know, anything unless you really truly believe that you can make it happen. Uh, so, uh, one thing that Makers Asylum probably stands upon is the cross-domain knowledge that it that the one is able to access being at such a space. So, how important will it be for entrepreneurs to have such cross-domain knowledge? That is my first question. And the follow-up to that is, uh, uh, what will your suggestions be for academicians, you know, to sort of incorporate this within the uh, school curriculum itself? Yeah. Um, so cross domain knowledge, um, I think for, I think it depends. I mean, uh, for entrepreneurs who are solving a certain kind of problem, I think at the end of the day, entrepreneurship is about solving problems, right? And for most of the entrepreneurs, it depends on what kind of problem that you're solving. But at the end of the day, if you are the decision maker, you need to know uh, a lot of things. You need to know uh, what you're solving for. You need to know if it's a product, you need to know a lot about the product, how it's made, what's, you know, what it is. And you obviously also need to know about the viability of that product. How do you sort of take it to market? So obviously one who's sort of making the decision while they might not be the, you know, might not be the expert in a domain, but I think the most important part is to surround yourself with people who know better than you. And that's what I think is very important for, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and having a really cross-functional, cross-domain team and an interdisciplinary group who is really good with what they do is key for most of the, and I'm sure that most of the successful entrepreneurs will say so as well, because it's not about them, but it's about the team that really drives the knowledge to the organization. So I would say that would uh, more from not for them to have it, but possibly, you know, have interdisciplinary groups around yourself to, you know, uh, keep creating more. And on the, on the question to the ac academicians, I think, um, uh, I think for us, we truly believe that it's important to have the hands-on, you know, experiential learning incorporated in what you do, because that makes you think, uh, you know, better some, you know, because if you're solving a problem, you already have your minds, which are open to, you know, taking more inputs from people and you're open to ideas. And when you are, um, 
traditionally when we're taught, we're taught in a very different way in terms of, you know, you learn something and you might use it later. But now the way of learning has become the other way around that you learn something that you want to use to solve a particular problem. So I think for academicians, I think it'd be very important to sort of change that tradi traditional thought process and incorporate problem solving rather than knowing something for a later stage, which you might not even use in life. So I guess uh, I think that's what it is. But we work a lot with academicians as well together to co-create and design things, which obviously because the traditional way of thinking and the traditional way of edu education has its pros as well. You can't completely say that, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, so it's a collaborative effort to sort of move towards a better way of learning, I think, in, in the future. Right. So, so if you talk about Makers Asylum, so uh, what are the different uh, sources of revenue for, for Makers Asylum? So how does, how does it make money? How are you guys uh, earning uh, revenue right now? Yeah, sure. uh, so in terms, of, um, in terms of the different uh, revenue streams that we have, we won, uh, one of the biggest revenue streams for us uh, has been through our programs and our uh, uh, teaching efforts. Teaching in the sense that, you know, uh, we have a lot of workshops, we have a lot of uh, experiential learning programs. Now we've also moved to have a lot of online programs, which are open to uh, younger, you know, age groups as well, like teenagers uh, that we're focusing on right now. Uh, one of our programs is called Innovation School, where we focus mm -hmm. on sort of creating uh, maker skills for the younger talents, because, uh, you know, a lot of people have coders and, you know, coding is presumed to be the, the future of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. skills and all of that. But I think a maker is a little bit more above a coder because, you know, then you also have the elements of uh, hardware. And given that India is going to hopefully eventually become a manufacturing, uh, you know, country, uh, you will need uh, youngsters who want to, you know, become makers at the end of the day. So, our, you know, we focus on a lot of online content around that. So a lot of our revenue dry, it comes in from programs that we do. Uh, then uh, we also, of course, the space is open for community and the members to come in. So a lot of people take memberships of the space, the active members who come and use the space, they also pay for the space, which is much more subsidized though, because we want to mm -hmm. give access to more and more people to sort of come and use the space. Uh, then the third part of it that we do is we also do a lot of uh, design consultancy work where we work on product design with different organizations, like I mentioned earlier as well. So a lot of um, work for them in terms of product design, so a lot of consultancy happens there. We also do uh, a lot of consultancy around creating spaces like these. So for example, we uh, co-create programs with different universities. How do you create a maker space? How do you develop the culture of making in different parts? So that's also another revenue stream that we work on. And now we also have retail. So we have a shop now where we are designing our own products and selling them. So uh, that's another revenue stream uh, now that we've sort of opened up in the last couple of months. So yeah, I think that pretty much covers. But I mean, as in when we have an opportunity to do something random, we also do that. So uh, it depends on what we like sort of doing and what sort of works with us. But yeah, these are primarily the revenue streams for Makers Asylum. Right. So is Makers Asylum funded by external investors or is it just completely organic? Uh, no, we're not funded by anybody. It's an independent organization. So we're, we're, we're self-sustainable for the last seven years. So we are... Uh, yeah, we're not making profits, but at least we are breaking even. So that's good. Uh, how does one get associated with Makers Asylum? Um, do you have remote uh, connecting uh, uh, abilities? Because uh, makers are everywhere around in India. So yeah. how does that work? Uh, I mean, but what you mean, uh, what do you mean to say when you say associated in the sense that you want to? So there are multiple ways of doing this. I mean, one, uh, you can obviously become a member of our space and you know uh, come to the space use it you can do that uh, the second bit of it could be you could be part of our programs you could be an alumni of our programs so through the programs you can do a bunch of stuff you can learn you can also obviously uh, be part of the community uh, because you're doing you know programs or workshops or whatever uh, through us then the third bit of it that, uh, that we've opened up now is that through our digital content that we are sort of putting out uh, we are also bringing in, bringing in makers who can be facilitators for these programs. 
because we believe that makers are the best teachers because they're very good with explaining things because they make it themselves. So a lot of makers across India, anybody who's listening to this podcast who would like to be an instructor with our digital content can also apply and, you know, we can, uh, we curate that as well. So that's another way of sort of associating with us to work. I mean, you can also work with us at some point when we have certain, you know, job roles uh, that are in place. So yeah, you can apply for that as well. But primarily, I think these are a couple of ways that you can possibly, you know, associate with Makers Asylum. Shreyas, uh, you have anything? Uh, nothing else from my side. Okay, I, I have one, uh, one question to ask. So, uh, so in, in terms of, uh, you know, before joining Makers Asylum, so I think you, you worked with the government of, of Andhra Pradesh as an executive assistant and also at IDEA. So I think both of them being strategic roles. So, um, so how did you, how did you manage to get into, uh, I mean, I mean, this is just out of my curiosity. I'm just asking this because how did you manage to get into a, a role with the government as an executive assistant? Uh, I think that's, that's a pretty big deal, uh, right? At least from a career point of view, if someone is looking to start out, so uh, a government job and as an executive assistant. So uh, how did that happen? So if you can just um, uh, explain yeah, that. Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, I was, um, like I said, I was at Indian School of Business after IDEA. Right. And um, uh, incidentally, uh, it's a very interesting story. Uh, so um, what had happened was, um, uh, they, I mean, you have those placement days, right, in most of the mm -hmm. schools. And uh, uh, on uh, day zero or day one, I think uh, there was this company called Stazilla back in the day. It's like Airbnb, uh, okay. but now they're shut. Uh, but Stazilla had come and I had gotten my, I mean, I had gotten placed like on the day zero or day one of the placement cycle, which is very early on. Mm -hmm. So I was um, only placed there as a brand manager and, you know, uh, all of that had happened. And uh, post that, you know, uh, there were like about three months um, into, we, so this happened in December in 2015. So, and then my graduation was in April, 2016. So obviously, once you get placed, you were pretty, I was pretty much uh, having uh, a good time. So partying, you know, or hanging out with friends and, you know, all kinds of stuff because you don't have to worry about anything. But, uh, uh, but what happened in March was that Stazula got back to us because they were facing some investor crunch and financial, you know, crisis because of whatever was going on in that market of, you know, uh, shared, uh, uh, you know, homes and things like that. So they said that they're going to delay uh, my joining, which was supposed to be, you know, whenever. Um, and uh, and we obviously realized because a bunch of us was pla were placed at that point in time. So we saw about 200 companies place the entire batch uh, in the two months that we were, two, three months that we were partying. You know, obviously we, you know, it was very, um, it was very, uh, you know, shock that came to us as well, because obviously we read a lot about it and it didn't seem like a very great option to sort of move to, because they were already delaying the joining, et cetera. So they were obviously facing a lot of crunch. Um, so incidentally, the government of Andhra Pradesh came in to hire the next week after this announcement with Stazilla, which was uh, second week of March. And my graduation was in the first week of April. And uh, so my boss then, uh, Mr. Chaudhary, who was the advisor to the chief minister, had come down himself to sort of, you know, uh, hire somebody for uh, this particular role. And, um, uh, and I was in two minds really to really go for a government job. And I was, you know, I was not really interested. So I just went for the heck of it that, okay, fine, let me just see what it is all about. And uh, yeah, and suddenly it worked out to be actually a very, very interesting uh, uh, you know, role of my career because, uh, uh, I mean, what Jay told me at that point in time, Mr. Chaudhary, who was my boss, that if you, if you want to experiment and learn, this is the place to be. And it sort of stayed in my head. And I said that, yeah, that's what I want to do. So as long as it's, you know, fun and I get to learn and uh, I'll, you know, it'd be fun. So, and in the whole process, I got a lot of opportunity to really see a lot of things. So yeah, it was quite interesting, but it was very, uh, it was not planned. And I think like most of the good things in life, uh, it, you know, it's not planned. So I, I don't know if I, how can I give anybody else the advice because it was not really something that I'd planned for. Right. Uh, okay. So does Maker Asylum have an uh, accelerator program for startups or will it probably have it in the future? 
uh, we are in uh, we are in fact working on it because this year we also plan to sort of uh, start a hardware accelerator uh, at Maker's Asylum. Uh, but we are obviously doing a bunch of stuff. So, but soon enough we will have something for startups as well because at Maker's Asylum organically there have been about twenty five to thirty startups that have come out of it. So we've we've you know it's just it's just the you know effect of the environment which exists over there so a lot of people a lot of small businesses come out of it so about 25 30 startups have come out of the space uh, so now we are sort of working on something interesting for them as well uh, but at the moment our main focus is to sort of work on the digital strategy for makers asylum and how to create uh, because we are integrating a lot of hardware products into digital content as well. So we're working uh, more from, I mean, I don't know, whatever it's called ed tech these days, I guess. So yeah, we're also working in the ed tech space a little bit now to create something which is unique uh, and which we think is really important. And yeah, we're working on that right now for the next couple of months, but hopefully uh, next year we should have something for the startups too. That's something to look forward to. Uh, yeah. And uh, what are the scaling uh, plans that you have? Like, uh, is it just going to be limited to Goa now, or is it going to get extended to probably Bangalore, the startup hub? Uh, well, uh, I, uh, physical expansion, uh, I think, is a very uh, difficult question at this point in time because uh, it requires a lot of uh, you know capital to do something like that. So at the moment, I think our expansion plan is more global in terms of becoming digital and how do you offer a space like this more digitally while integrating hardware also in it. So we're working towards sort of really innovative ideas to sort of come up with that. And hopefully that works out better than, you know, having a physical infrastructure. Yeah, that, that actually follows the major trend that uh, that's happening currently. Uh, that <laughs> is, uh, yeah. Um, Aditya? I actually I ran out of questions. I mean, we've got so much already. <laughs> uh, yeah. are sort of running out of questions. So, uh, Shreyas or Yashas, if you have anything. I think yeah, uh, having a covered... hardware accelerator in India is a, a very good thing because uh, India lacks a hardware uh, environment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think for us personally, uh, our skill set lies in hardware and design. And... Uh, mm. For us, everything will be focused at the core of it on hardware. So that's what we are progressing with. And we think that hopefully with the community and everything that we've learned in the last couple of years, uh, we'll be able to create something exciting uh, in the space of hardware for sure. Yeah, one personal question is that how do you manage to work with uh, Onul or Vaibhav? Uh, because they both are very good in their uh, fields. So how do you manage to work there? <laughs> I have been following Anul from a long time. Uh, yeah. From his hack day. Yeah. Anul is like, um, he's the hardware genius. So it's very, uh, obviously a lot of it I don't understand. But, uh, but I think uh, what we do best as a team is let the person who's really skilled at that particular job do their thing. And, uh, but we communicate a lot with each other. So uh, for me, working with Anul and Webhav is, um, you know, like um, makers are a different kind of breed and both of them are really good makers and uh, they have their own ideas and they have their own vision. And obviously me also from a perspective of what I am doing, I have my own uh, ideologies and, you know, stand. But I think what we do best is we really collaborate well as a team and then we split to do whatever we do best. So, and come back again and then, you know, convene. So, uh, it's just more fun because I get to learn a lot. Hopefully they also get to learn from me. So it's like a, a symbiotic relationship that we share. But yeah, of course, I mean, I have to admit that when a lot of times Anul um, talks about a lot of things that I don't understand, but, uh, but uh, he's, quite, um, he's quite approachable and he'll explain it to you. Even with Webhav, it's like, it's just like that because if you don't understand some parts of it, uh, they both are really, really good uh, teachers as well. Right. Now, now that you've said that, I just have a follow up question. Uh, so has it happened at any point of time that, uh, you know, uh, when a lot of members get together and they're working on something exciting just because they're really passionate and interested about it. But sometimes you also feel that uh, maybe this is not worth the time. Uh, maybe this does not bring in uh, 
revenue or it, it might not get us the, the sort of uh, recognition uh, that, that we need. So at that point of time, how do you handle those, those sort of conflicts? Uh, well, at, at Makers Asylum, I think um, uh, like organically, um, you know, community projects are something that we really value. And uh, I think for us, uh, those are the most exciting ones, especially for the team, because that really brings in a different kind of energy to the space. So yes, a lot of times you will not be able to bring in revenue with it, or you will not be able to do a lot of stuff uh, financially with it maybe. But I think as a community, because we at the core of it, we are a community space for us. It's very important to, you know, get the community together to work with them. Even if we are not doing something, uh, they're doing it. We can, you know, we can help them with whatever that we can at that point in time. I mean, we try to do our best in terms of what we can, you know, provide. And then, uh, but I think in most of the cases I've seen that even if, uh, you know, even if it doesn't make any financial sense for us, uh, we just go for it because uh, it's just uh, keeps us motivated more than anything else to you know, have the community sort of come, use the space, do something super exciting. And most of the community projects, honestly, are, are truly uh, very exciting. And there's some really fan fantastic projects that have been documented over the years. And I don't think so uh, any paid project uh, can sort of compete with you know, yeah. organic projects like these. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so coming to the probably the final question. Uh, so there is a rise uh, in what we call the gig economy, where people uh, what economy? gig economy, the mm -hmm. wherein people uh, they don't start to, they start to work without organizations, and probably makers asylum is a hub for that kind of people, where they come together and do what they love. Uh, so, what what will be the top three skills that you would uh, recommend such people should have, probably to succeed in their uh, careers? Like freelancers, are you talking about freelancers? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think the uh, freelancer community is, I think, the most blessed community because they can do whatever they feel like, <laughs> and it's just, I think, it's amazing how, uh, uh, you know, that whole uh, uh, idea of digital nomads and being wherever that you want and do whatever that you want, which never was the case. I think when I was uh, studying, I wish I had that much, uh, you know. Uh, talent to sort of do something like this. But I think, um, I think for freelancers, I think the most important thing is, um, uh, I think their collaborative, uh, you know, skills, because I think for them to sort of blend into and understand a project and plug in their skill over there is super important. So one would be that I'm sure. Uh, and of course, the depth of knowledge that they gain over the years uh, is also very important because, um, I mean, I think freelancers are, I mean, for us, we've worked with so many freelancers over the years now. Uh, their skills really are so, I mean, the quality of the skills becomes really high because when you hire a organization versus a freelancer, uh, there's definitely that personal touch of things when you're doing work with them, uh, their personal side comes out of it and their personal views come out of, or come out of it. And uh, a lot more can happen with, you know, the freelancing community. So we are a big believer in freelancers and, you know, makers who, independently want to do stuff with us. So I think collaboration is definitely key for them. Uh, obviously knowing their, their, whatever their skill is, you know, deep diving into it and learning more about it, I think really gives them a lot of edge because, um, you know, uh, that's a differentiator for them for sure in that particular domain or whatever that they're doing. And I think, I think in general, I think that life, uh, I'm quite envious of that life. So I wish even I was one, oh, you know, if I could have that much talent to become a freelancer, I would be one as well. Right. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything else. I think we've got a lot of things, a lot of, uh, lot of learnings, a lot of insights. Shreyas or Yashis, uh, do you have anything? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Thanks, thanks, Richa. Thanks for doing this. Thanking, thanks for taking your time out, uh, first of all, to do this. Uh, personally, uh, if I have to speak for myself, uh, it was a great uh, learning experience. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for taking your time out. Thanks. Thank you, guys. It was really uh, fun talking with all three of you. Thank you for having me. Thanks.
Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We have lots more to come on this channel since we have lined up a few more guests after this. Be sure to like, share and subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive updates. In the description below, I have provided the LinkedIn page link followers on LinkedIn to receive new notifications. So until next time, it's goodbye.